Hello, and welcome to the Motherhood Village podcast. I am on with two very special guests. We have Ilana Yara, and we have Kim Hanlon, who are grief advocates and advanced certified grief recovery specialists. They are fueled by their own personal loss experiences. They co-founded Yarav and Hanlon Grief Support out of a shared passion for offering individual grief supports and enhancing corporate wellness programs to support employees around loss and life changes. Their tools and programs help increase productivity, emotional intelligence, resilience, retention, and engagement both in the workplace and in one's personal life. Ilana and Kim take what can be a very difficult topic and through gentleness, humor, and vulnerability, make it accessible for all. They have worked with corporations, higher education institutions, law firms, and individuals, and have recently consulted on a film about suicide laws to bring insight, tools, and support to process the difficult themes throughout the film. With the belief that it is important to meet grievers exactly where they are, Ilana and Kim continue to create new ways to engage and support them from workbooks to online courses and workshops. They are the authors of the digital workbook, Grief and Gratitude, Building Your Coping Action Plan, with the goal of having it in print by the end of 2022. Ladies, thank you so much for coming on. I'm very excited to dive into grief for various reasons. But before we dive into the main conversation, let's get into my icebreaker round. And um, you could both answer if you feel like it or one or the other. So it's up to you. What is your favorite book or one that you would like to recommend? Mm. Well, firstly, thank you so much for having us here. We're both really happy to be here and to share more about our passion and our work. So thank you for having us. Thank you. And books. Well, there's a few, but I will say my all-time favorite book is The Alchemist mm. by Paulo Coelho, which I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I really hope, well, really need to learn how to pronounce it correctly. But that book, I, I read it, try to read it at least once a year when, especially on uh, our, the Day of Atonement in, in Yom Kippur. So I really love to read it because it talks all around your personal legend and finding yourself. And it's just such a wonderful message. So if you all haven't read it, definitely recommend The Alchemist. That's really a good one. Story, Yes, that is. Kim, what about yourself? Um, So it's hard to pick a favorite (laughs) book because it also depends on the mood. And, you know, I like Isabel Allende book if I'm more in the historical fiction mood. Um. And, you know, I do really, I didn't enjoy the book called The Book of Joy, where there's interviews with Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama. Um, I loved the way joy was framed as something that we could always be striving for, even through difficult times. And that, of course, resonated with the work Alana and I do, Um, you know, working to help people be able to, to hold that capacity for joy and for hope, even when they're experiencing loss. Absolutely. And a lot of times when I ask ask this question, you know, if you're an avid reader, it's difficult, right? But I think it's just something that kind of either has resonated with you or that you feel my listeners or the listeners should connect with. Um, So thank you. Those sound, I know the alchemist um, and the book of joy sounds like an awesome, awesome read as well. What are the values that guide you and your families? Okay, sure. Um, so a lot of values actually for my family are are values from Judaism. So there's a lot of family values and being kind to each other and respectful. And so those are really big guiding values for us. And you know, communication, being in integrity, um, respectful of each other, but actually just having conversations, you know, where we're very loud, <laughs> we're very vocal, <laughs> and we get mad at each other and we make up. And so really grateful. That's something really important that we constantly are able to communicate. I mean, that's a little harder with a two-year-old, but we're working on that. <laughs> but but yeah, a lot of Judaism really fuels our values and just being a good human, being a good person, yes, striving to be. Kim, what about you? Oh gosh, I was rolling my eyes a little bit about having the conversation when there's a little one around. (laughs) The constant interruptions are lovely and just also (laughs) need lots of deep breaths. Um, But some of our values are around being in community, being thoughtful of others, 
um, and you know, what their needs are and where they are coming from as their own unique selves. Uh, and then really trying to support each other to be our authentic selves and show up the way we need to. I love that. And how has motherhood transformed you both? Oh my gosh. So many, so many ways. <laughs> you can start. <laughs> yeah. Sure. It has really pushed me to continually try to learn and learn how to be myself even when I feel like in the beginning of motherhood, especially I lost some of that agency of my own life because this little person demanded so much, rightfully so. And so it was a big effort to work on how do I set boundaries so that I can take care of myself and still meet the needs of this person and our family when so much of my identity and routine, everything was being shifted. Yeah, I think that's one of the hardest parts, right? It's, it's, and I know we're going to talk about part of that grieving process, but it's remaining yourself and dealing with everything you have to go through, but you have this little person you have to take care of. So for sure, Alana. Yeah. And they forgot to tell me when I got pregnant, there are no sick days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I missed that memo. Um, but yeah, everything Kim said, and I'm actually pregnant with my second right now. I'm almost Ooh. eight months pregnant. So, and my first is almost two years old and it really has taught me a different level of patience and humility. And sometimes I'm like, I, I'm really, I'm the one in charge here. <laughs> you know, I remind my husband, I'm like, we're the adults here. <laughs> the two-year-old dictator still has to go to bed, even if she doesn't want to, yes. you know, and just sometimes just being in such awe of this little tiny human that I have this love for that I like everyone told me that you find this when you have a kid it's a love you've never experienced and I'm like yeah yeah and it's so true how you have this little human you love so much but are also counting down the seconds until bedtime and then counting down the seconds till they wake up and you can kiss them and then when they go to school so it's it's such a interesting um juxtaposition of emotions and one other huge thing motherhood has has taught me is just I have a very different level of respect for my parents now. Like just looking on things that you know, I don't agree with everything, but a lot of times I'm like, wow, might have been a little hard on you, mom. So if you're <laughs> listening to this, you know, I'm sorry, mom. <laughs> Absolutely. It's hard. It, it is. is hard. It is. I think that appreciation for our parents goes deep. Once we have children, we realize for good, bad or worse, like, wow, for sure. Um, and they did not have the resources that I feel like we have now and things that we know better over time. So for sure. It takes a village, I always say, to raise a child. But more importantly, it takes a village to uplift a mother. Who and what has been a part of your motherhood village? Definitely Alana, for, for sure. You know, we both awesome. lean on each other. Um, and, you know, I'm grateful that I have some local friends too. Alana and I are both in the Bay area, but, um, not close enough to really just <laughs> pop over to one each other's house. But, um, like right now my kid is over at a neighbor's house playing with kids that are close in age. And so I have those moms that I can call on for play dates with just the kids or to go out for drinks and, uh, share about whatever's coming up for us. And that's been huge. Um, and, you know, I was just talking with Alana about this the other day and jokingly saying that uh, TV too. I mean, to be <laughs> real, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, TV and Netflix was part of my village of helping keep my kid entertained while I was working. And yeah, it feels very weird to say that, but yeah. <laughs> It's very real, but it's it's very honest, right? And I think I think every mother listening to this or parents can attest to that. <laughs> the minions are big in our house. <laughs> yes. What about you, Alana? Oh, Kim, for sure. And um, I've actually I have I met a group of moms. I, I call them my Tinder moms because we <laughs> met on this app called Peanut, which is kind of like Tinder. Mm -hmm. So for anyone who hasn't heard of, it's actually a really great way to meet people and. 
they match you up like peanut butter and jelly <laughs> and and like dating you know there's some you connect with some you don't but anyway I've met a group of moms on there that you know we we meet up every so often and are just able to you know support each other and we're like sleep regression didn't they just have one last week how is there another sleep regression I'm always asking Kim about that because her son is older than my daughter but yeah just and I've started my community's shifted you know since having a baby you know it, it's definitely shifted I've started to meet new mom like other moms and relationships shifted which has also been kind of different for me but I've also met different people who I might not have met before through our kids, you know, through daycare and through just playing at the park. And so that's been really, really cool to just see how it's shifted. But also it's sometimes hard because I'm an East Coast transplant. So a lot of, you know, people I, you know, a lot of my close friends are still like scattered everywhere. So I'm very grateful to have Kim and the moms that I've met that are starting to become, you know, really my community. That's awesome. So I know you have a two-year-old. Kim, what are your children's ages? I have one six and a half year old. One six and a half. Okay. My son just turned five. Um, so okay. we're at that stage. Yeah. That's the nice talking back, emotional. Um, <laughs> that's the that's the stage that we're at. He's like five going on 15. Um, oh, like yes. a lot of life questions and why this and what if this? And I'm like, whoa, I am not prepared for this. Um, <laughs> a lot of cheeky. Yeah, but I'm going to go into because that goes into, I, I want to ask now, what has been your journey? Um, and I know in saying your bio, it was a very personal, you guys started on your journey into grief support due to your own personal experiences. Why did you come together? What was that like? And what has that journey been like to come into grief support? Because as even saying it in your bio, it is a very heavy topic, right? People hear grief and it's like, whoa, a lot of people don't want to talk about that. We don't talk about it. I don't think enough, which is why I think this conversation is so important. But tell me. I found grief support for myself, um, just trying to find something to help me when uh, my brother died by drug overdose nearly 11 years ago and felt like I was floundering for a couple of years, just doing the things that I thought I should do to support myself in grief of talking with friends, going to therapy. And I still felt so lost that when I found the grief recovery method, which really helped me highlight where I was incomplete with my relationship with my brother and really validate my feelings, sure. of the whole range of the feelings that I was having. Um, I knew that I wanted to, to help others to find that hope again and find themselves again. Um, and then you know, after practicing for a few years, both of us individually, we came together um, through a networking group of just local certified grief recovery method specialists. And Alana and I realized we were really aligned. We liked working together. As we collaborated more, we decided to join a partnership. So it's been, it's been great. Awesome. And then I'll ask you, Alana, what is the difference between, let's say, someone going to grief support and someone just going to therapy? So they're they're very different and they're wonderful compliments. I just want to say that first, because some people say, is it, is it OK if we see our therapist? Oh. <laughs> like, yes, please keep seeing your therapist. Sure. Because the way so the way Kim and I approach grief is very, very different from therapy. We have several modalities, like the grief recovery method that Kim mentioned, which is an evidence-based, action-based program. So it's it's there's essentially, I guess you could say, a curriculum that we follow through that. Sure. Of course, within that, we meet grievers where they are. Um, so that's one thing. And it's more interactive. Therapy typically is, you know, the therapist does not share much about themselves. Um, in our work, we share a lot about ourselves. It also helps kind of connect with people, validate, normalize. Um, and when we're not using the grief recovery method and using other modalities that we've created, again, um, we use our own life experience as well for a lot, coupled with our professional experience and training. Sure. And so they differ in that way. And it's more, there's, you know, it can, it can be more interactive um, and it's a lot of 
um, really depending where the griever is. And so again, I just really, really want people to hear therapy is amazing and wonderful. Grief support is amazing and wonderful. They are great compliments. They go very well together. Or even some people will take pause with therapy while they're doing the grief recovery method or some grief work, which is okay too, but they're wonderful, wonderful compliments to each other. One last thing, and a lot, and this might have been what Kim was going to say, because we do share a brain sometimes, um, <laughs> is a lot of therapists are not trained in grief. So there's a lot of times where, you know, which is kind of un- honestly mind boggling to me that it, it's not more like it should be a huge part of the curriculum, but it's not. And so oftentimes we have much more expertise in grief specifically than therapists do. And so it's important, you know, so it's important for people who are specifically looking for grief support that not all therapists are trained in grief and they should be seeking a grief specialist as opposed to a therapist for specific grief, unless of course they're trained in grief. Understood. And that's a good point. Kim, do you want anything to add before I get into how do you define grief, right? We're talking about this word. What does it mean? So do you have anything to add as far as the difference between uh, grief support therapy and anything that you and Alana add differently? Just wanting to emphasize, and, and Alana did speak to this, that it's the work that we do is more action-based um, and you know, educational. Um, so there's you know different focus a different way of, of working with our clients too. Awesome. So now let's get into what is grief? How do you define it? And what are the different stages of grief? So I'm just going to start here by saying there are no stages of grief. Mm-hmm. Okay. Grief is a very nonlinear process that, you know, it comes as waves. Um, there's no defined way that anyone goes through grief. And so just want to put that out so- there. Um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, when she outlined the stages of grief, that was specific to people dying of a terminal illness, Mm -hmm. not to grief itself. So sometimes people can get very stuck in that because like, when am I going to feel bargaining or when am I going to feel denial? Or, you know, the truth is you may never feel those or you may feel them all at the same time, along with 7 trillion other emotions. And they're all normal and natural. And there's like no real wrong way to grieve. Some people say, well, when am I going to move through the stages? Am I grieving wrong? And so just want to say right there, you're, you are you may feel all those things. You may not feel all those things, but it's, we don't want you to have another reason to, when you're grieving, to beat yourself up. If, you know, people come to us, I'm not grieving correctly. I haven't felt, you know, denial yet. And like, well, you know, you may not feel denial. Doesn't mm-hmm. mean you're grieving wrong. It means you're grieving right. You're grieving how you need to grieve. Sure. So just wanted to get that out. Um, Kim, did you want to add anything on that? No, you, you covered it. <laughs> for the stages. <laughs> and how do you define grief, though? Like, what is that? Because like you said, because it means it's from what I'm taking is that it's a personal experience for everybody, I would imagine, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, but is there a different kind of grief where, like you said, someone that maybe loses somebody suddenly, right, that came out of the you know, came out of left field or the type of grief, truthfully, that I'm used to, unfortunately, um, are losing family members to some time, a type of um, terminal illness, right? Mm-hmm. All through the different stages of my life, starting from when I was probably like in elementary school. So that's a different kind in my mind. No, not different. So tell me if I'm using a wrong phrase, but it's watching someone suffer, watching someone go through hospice, seeing that whole flow, and then having to say goodbye as opposed to the immediate. So maybe touch upon, Kim, if you want to take this one, how do you define grief? And then maybe what are the different types of grief, if maybe that's what I'm trying to allude to. Yeah, definitely. Um, So the core definitions that we use are that grief is the normal and natural reaction to loss of any kind. We always love to highlight that people grieve more than death or divorce. Um, You can grieve positive things in life, like getting married. um, Becoming a parent. Uh, yes, de- definitely becoming a parent. Sure. Um, because we grieve when something familiar ends or changes. And, you know, that could be a pattern of behavior, that can be 
um, you know, a relationship. It can be so many different things. Our identity, like we were talking about before becoming a parent. Um, And some of those distinctions where it can feel different depending on the loss type, like you were talking about, whether it was sudden or, you know, watching someone have a more prolonged end of life um, is one distinction we like to make is that there's a difference between grief and unresolved grief um, and areas where we tend to get stuck and feel unresolved and grief is where we think wish things were different, better, more where we had these unmet hopes, dreams, expectations. And if we just felt like we weren't able to communicate anything of a, an emotional nature to someone like our love our appreciation or how much they hurt us, you know, good or bad. Um, and so we have these different aspects of unresolved grief, no matter what the loss is, but for different types of loss, um, we may have more or just different types of areas we feel unresolved if I'm being clear. And, um, And so grief is grief, but definitely the experience can feel different for different people, depending on the relationship they had, the loss type, um, the circumstances of the loss. Um, You know, we've written about how stigmatized losses can also feel different, like the death of my brother by drug overdose, um, or we've worked with the suicide community. Um, Now she is going to try to walk on the keyboard. Um, yeah, so definitely it can feel different and we're happy to clarify more if there's other questions that you have about that. Sure. Alana, do you want to jump into that and maybe speak on anything further? What are the different types and how does grief or what can, if someone's listening to this, right? Um, cause I'm sure you might even have people that say, no, I was, I'm fine. Like you said, where someone might feel like, oh, where's the denial stage or no, it's okay. Or I didn't even cry. Maybe talk about what can grief look and feel like from the immediate sudden of once, you know, when we lose something and, and um, Kim, thank you for touching upon that because I think that's important to say we can grieve, like you said, getting married and realizing that you're grieving your single life. Right. I've been divorced before I married my high school boyfriend and the divorce was a grieving process. I went through the whole emotions of grieving that even though it was a toxic relationship, I had known this person for a very long time. And I had to come to terms with that, like, oh, grief isn't just about death and losing a family member or a friend. There are different things. So why don't you touch upon that of what grief looks and feels like and what it can feel like to someone who's listening that maybe did lose someone? So grief can look different on all of us. You know, some people, you know, have that smile plastered on their face all day. You know, just, I just, I I keep thinking about Robin Williams, Mm -hmm. you know, and Robin Williams, who, you know, we all grew up with, kept us laughing and made us feel safe. And he was that person on the outside that always had that smile on. And then on the inside, now we all know how much he was really hurting. And so sometimes grief is not always visible because some people are able to hide it some people stay really really busy like those people who volunteer for everything and are just go 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 but you don't see them behind closed doors you know and I'll, I'll give you an example to illustrate how you know people even grieving the same relationship when my father died the way my brothers and I grieved was completely different you know and all of them were normal all of them were natural I did not stop crying I think for probably good four months, <laughs> you know, I stopped crying long enough to give a eulogy. Um, and that was about it. My older brother got really quiet and felt like he had to take over the whole family. And my little brother didn't say a word. My little brother just, you know, he basically had to carry me out of the funeral, kept everything inside, wouldn't even tell anyone that our dad passed. So if people asked about our dad, he'd be like, yeah, you retired. <laughs> like, all right, well, it's not a whole lie. You know, but we we all dealt with it very, very differently. And none of them were right. None of them were wrong. But it's just how we dealt with losing our dad. And that that goes for people for all different types of losses. Every single loss is experienced at 100%. You know, but as Kim started to say, 
sometimes stigmatized losses can be even you know, harder because there can feel like there's different kinds of judgment from people and maybe less support the suicide survivor community. You know, that's another stigmatized loss. And so that can definitely add another layer sure. of grief to it. One thing is important to note is that all grief is valid and people's way of grieving, you know, there's really no right or wrong way and there's no one way that it looks right? Or that some people just like binge on Netflix. You know, my go-to was Law and Order SVU and Eggplant Parm. Like when I needed to just get into my like, which in retrospect, SVU is not really great to watch when you're <laughs> grieving or depressed, but, but, um, but yeah, just to show that it just, it looks very different on people. And that's, I think another reason why grief isn't talked about as much because sometimes you can look at someone and they can seem perfectly totally together in public and we don't know what's going on behind closed doors we don't know what kind of tears you know when I went back to work after my dad died I can't even tell you how many times I'd run to the bathroom to cry you know and then I'd come back into work you know a little puffy here but you know carry on um, and I'm not saying that's the best way to go or not the best way to go but it's it's normal and so just really want your listeners to hear that however they are grieving is okay. If they need to go smile and go out and laugh, you know, of course, being safe, you know, making sure you're not putting yourself in harm or others in harm. But sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And it's okay. Let However you feel is valid. Let me ask the follow up. And then Kim, I'm going to ask you a, a part two. And of course, you can jump in and add anything. But let me ask you a follow up to that. What can someone who's watching someone grieve do to support them? I think that's a big one that we don't talk about enough because people get awkward, right? Like, what do I say? What do I, I feel, I understand, I support, peace, love, sending prayers, condolences. Tell me, how can someone who's watching this, what could your coworkers have done? Could they have, to, you know, speak on that a little bit of how someone can support someone who they do know they are grieving or have just felt a loss in some way? The number one rule of thumb is is to be genuine, is to come from a place of caring. Kim and I like to share the image of a heart with ears, you know, that you're just, you're, you're literally being a heart with ears and come from that place. And, you know, sometimes if you don't know what to say, it's better to say something like literally to say, I don't know what to say, but I'm here. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to say, but I'm thinking of you. And it's honest. It's real. It's better than not saying anything at all. Another thing to do is is to offer specifics so not to say to the person hey if you need anything let me know well <laughs> there's a lot of things I need but to specifically say hey can I come by Tuesday with cheese pizza or you know like what kind of pizza do you like can I drop it by on this day at this time or I'm going to pick you up at two o'clock and we're going to go to Starbucks sure. you know and to leave that open to them but to offer something specific knowing they may say no but just keep offering and also to say no need to respond, you know, so if say, cause people struggle like with voicemails or text messages, but to just say, Hey, you know, I don't know what to say. I'm thinking of you, no pressure to respond at all. And I'll check back in, you know, in, in next week or whenever, and just to make sure you check in. So biggest is to be authentic, come from a place of love and compassion, not of curiosity you know, when people are like, tell me what happened, tell me all the details, not helpful. But if you say, you know, do you want to talk about it? You know, I'm here. I'm here. If you want to talk about what's on your mind and heart, I don't know what to say, but I'm here. I'm thinking of you. I'm sending thoughts and prayers. And I'm just, I'm so sorry. You know, something that is real. Understood. Um, Kim, do you have anything to add? And then my question to you, if you, if you add to this part, is what are maybe some misconceptions people do have about grief and what the grief process looks like? If maybe you want to touch upon what that could be, but do you want to add anything to this particular part? You know, a lot of people ask us, you know, it's particularly around how, what do I say to someone who's just had a loss? And Alana was just speaking to that. And we really want to highlight that understanding those definitions of grief, that grief is normal and natural, and that people aren't broken if they're struggling with grief, that grief can look messy, and that sure. might just be what it looks like for that person. Um, 
and that's really a, a key part for healing for people is to feel really truly heard. So having, just like Alana said, someone embody that heart with ears can be such a blessing for someone to feel that they can share even things that don't make sense. You know, I, I had so many random thoughts after my brother died, um, that thankfully I was able to share with my husband, um, about weird dreams of just, you know, like, what if he's really alive? What if he didn't actually die? And I'd seen his body. Like I knew sure, wasn't logical, but, um, that was part of something that I needed to to share and say out loud and, um, and not so, feel shame and not feel judged, but to have a safe space to share that. So yeah, letting someone say those things and, and not feeling the need to fix them or have the right thing to say, like Alana said, you can, you can say, I don't know what to say or ask some questions enough to help them share their story. But again, not to satisfy your own curiosity, but to help that other person feel that they can share and open up. Um, and then with respect to misconceptions, um, you know, the, the stages of grief are a huge one. Um, and then also there are lots of myths that we all hear and learn about how we're supposed to grieve, be it that time heals all wounds. Um, you know, so just, just give it time and you'll feel better. And, you know, for that one, it's true. Many people can feel better in time, but it's typically because they did something or something happened that helped them heal, but it wasn't time. It was the actions they took in that time. Um, so that's a key distinction. Um, but someone may reach that point of healing, you know, in months, whereas another person, it could take years. Sure. Um, and when we speak to healing too, it's, it's not like you don't have your grief. You always have your grief, but you can have that capacity for joy. You can talk about your person without crying each time you hear their name. Um, you know, you get to a, a different place in your grief where again, you don't have so much unresolved, um, you know, going back to that distinction we were talking about earlier of grief versus unresolved grief. Um, other misconceptions are, you know, about how we have to show up for grief of whether we need to be strong or put on that happy face, you know, just don't feel bad. And, you know, at least they had a long life or at least they got to, you know, go on that big trip before they died. Um, those types of things, which can be intellectually true, but it doesn't really do anything for our grief because, grieving happens in the heart, not in our heads. Um, and of course we need them to work together, but a key part is being able to still feel our feelings without shooting them away of like, Oh, I shouldn't actually feel bad because they lived a long life. Um, you know, we can still miss our person regardless. Please, if you have more, um, cause I know we're going to wind up here, but then I want to say that we'll be having a part two and possibly even a part three and the next section being how do we talk to our children about grief, motherhood and grief? Like that's a whole nother side of things I want to dive into. But is there anything else that you want to discuss with regards to misconceptions or Alana, if you want to jump in there? And then I do have a final two questions before we wrap this conversation up. I feel like we could always talk about this forever. <laughs> but so I'll let Alana <laughs> share some of her thoughts. <laughs> Just yeah, two two things to add. One incredible visualization of of just what of the grief process is. Oh, we have two, but in the interest of time, I'll share one. Is if you think of a flat tire, you know, when your car has a flat, what are you gonna do with your tire? Are you gonna sit and look at it and hope the air will go back in? You know, some people will change it. If you're like me, I'll be calling AAA or my husband to change it. But but the fact is you're taking an action for that. You're not just sitting there and saying that the tire air is going to go back into the tire if we give it time. Just like a broken bone. You're not going to sit there. You're going to have it. You're going to go to the doctor. You're going to have it set. You're going to have physical therapy. A broken heart is the same except for that we can't see it. 
You know, if you think about like a broken leg, everyone wants to sign your cast, you know, and it's very visible opposed to a broken heart. It's not always so vis visible, especially for people who are super private, who put on that smile outside of the house, but you don't see what's going on behind the scenes. So I think it's very, we can just, we can use that visual to also dispel the myths, but to just show how grief really, it, it's not, as Kim said, so beautifully, it's not, it's not just that time, it's what we do within that time. You know, it's calling AAA, it's getting that new tire. So sure. it's getting grief support. It's, it's resolving, working through our unresolved grief. And so it's important of, of that action that we take within our time. Because, you know, and of course, there's some, there's some element of time itself, too, of just, sure. you know, having a little bit of breathing space to breathe into it. So of course, yes, that's important. But it's also the two. It's what we do with our time. As we wrap up here, how can people connect with you? And are there any other programs that you want to mention that I know you talked about some programs that you guys have specifically, but there is there anything as we wind up here um, that you want to say that you also offer as your grief support together um, and then how people can connect with you? And then, as I stated, we will have part two coming up, um, which I'm excited for because that's going to be the whole motherhood side of things. Yeah, so people can connect with us on social, on our website. We actually have a special gift for your listeners um, where we have 10% um, off of our workbook. So we have a coupon code for all of your listeners as, awesome. you know, as a thank you. And as, you know, just we're all here, <laughs> you know, we're all can all support each other. So we can, I guess, give you all of these links. We're on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. And we have a what's blog that we. Yes. What's your website? It's yadavhanlon.com, Y-A-H-D-A-V-H-A-N-L-O-N.com. And actually one other thing. So we, we have a blog that we publish every other week in our newsletter. And we're always, you know, part of our blog, the reason we created our blog was for us to be able to share some of our personal stories. And, if, and we wanted to say, you know, if, if you have a topic you want to write about you and any of your listeners okay. to contact us because part of grief is to have that like part of healing and working through grief is to be seen and heard and witnessed and so if any of you have interest in writing about your own experience around grief whatever that is you know definitely contact us and we'd love to to highlight you and you know either interview in a blog or have you write your own blog for our blog Oh, I want to awesome. plant that seed there too. I love that. Kim, any other final or even Alana, if you want to end with any other final yeah. words as we wrap up part one. But just to speak um, real briefly about what our workbook offers, yeah. um, you know, we <laughs> have, uh, you know, our grief support programs where we work one-on-one -on -one with, with grievers to help them discover, you know, what's unresolved for them in their grief. And our workbook provides 10 different tools plus some extra because we always get excited and put more in there. Um, 10 different tools that people can explore, practice, and then combine in their own unique way to have a personalized toolkit around a difficult date, say a um, loved one who's passed away has an anniversary coming up or the holidays, which can be so difficult. Yes. You know, so it could be so helpful to have that toolkit to know who you can call or what are some ways that you can kind of take something off your plate during that time, come up with affirmations. If that's something that makes sense for you, you know, we have several different things outlined um, and we're just, you know, really excited to be able to, to offer that. Awesome. And yeah. I'm very um, honored to have you both on to speak on this and to offer that for my community. So thank you. This has been awesome. I have so much more questions and I know when I listen back to part one of how we can jump into part two. Um, so for my listeners out there, stay tuned for part two coming up where we will discuss the grieving process in motherhood, how to talk to our children. I know that's a big one. My son and I already have conversations. He's already asked me about death and all the things, right? And I know we there's a lot that our children are exposed to now right with the different tragedies mm. and things so i'm um, definitely looking forward to having that conversation with you but thank you both so much for coming on and um, continued blessings to you both for love and light thank you nicole thank you so much.